I'm going to invite you to have a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 is our text today. If uh, you're here and you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1039 and you will find our text for the day. And if you're new here and, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, let me just say uh, Happy New Year. Oh, thanks. You know, I, I, I appreciate that. you got to kind of start the year off that way. It's the first weekend of 2018, but I have to confess, too, I was kind of the guy that on uh, the third or the fourth, when people were saying Happy New Year, I was like, all right, can we be over that by now? You know, because, uh, but I wasn't here last weekend to say Happy New Year and everything, and uh and I miss being here, so I want to say that. I, I love the fact that I get to be here and kick off 2018 with you. Uh, I hate the fact that I'm sick, and so I don't really get to be with you. Uh, those of you who are here early probably noticed I wasn't out greeting people because I decided it wouldn't be godly to share my germs with you. And, uh, and, and so if you're sick, uh, we appreciate you making that same choice as well. But, uh, but it is awesome to be here because today we are kicking off our Freeway series. A not-so-perfect guide to freedom. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that everyone decides to fully participate. And, and by fully participate, uh, what I mean is, is, is simply this, that you're going to invest yourself in this series for the next seven weeks, which means showing up for worship, unless you're sick or unless you're traveling, in which case we have calvarylhc.com. You just go to our website. You can download the sermons. You can listen to them. You can watch them, whatever uh, you prefer. But invest yourself in worship. Invest yourself in a life group. Uh, you can sign up for a life group when you walk out of here today. There, there's tables right outside the front doors. And, uh, and I'm just going to encourage you to, to get in a life group for this series. If you're not in a life group regularly, you're missing out. But for this series especially, because there's nothing like applying the truth that you hear face-to-face -face with other people uh, and doing that. And if you're kind of freaked out by the idea of going to somebody's house that you don't know and sitting with people that you know, in, a, in too intimate of a setting, then come here on Thursdays and, and do the large group thing, but go out and sign up for it so they can have resources available for you when you come. Uh, the third thing is do the homework. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in your bulletin there are life notes that actually have uh, like application questions that go beyond just what we do on the sermon notes. And, and so I'd encourage you, even if you're not in a life group, to take those and maybe get together with your, your spouse or some friends or your family and, and just talk through those and, and do the homework. If you're in a life group, you're going to have a workbook. And, and if you want one of those workbooks and you're not in a life group, check us out next week. We'll, we'll probably have some extras left over. But, but, uh, but do the homework. You know, invest in it because we all want freedom. You, you guys want freedom? Okay, good. I'm glad you guys want freedom. Uh, you guys were a little bit more enthusiastic than the other services have been. I'll, I'll tell you that, but it still were a lot like, yay, freedom. It's kind of like, like, yeah, freedom. Of course, we're not talking about, you know, political freedom because we live in a free society. Uh, so technically, all of us are free, but so many of us aren't. You know, we're prisoners. We're prisoners of our fears, our failures, our flaws. Uh, we're prisoners of addictions and abuses. We're held captive by our secrets. We're trapped in brokenness, pain, depression, and despair. And we long for freedom. But freedom is hard. You know, as a nation, uh, we gained our freedom by going to war, by fighting for it, by people dying for it. As a nation, we've protected and preserved our freedom because men and women were willing to give their lives to protect our freedom. Freedom is something that is risky and is costly. And, and, and I'm sharing that with you because if you want spiritual freedom in your life, then you're going to have to invest yourself. You're going to have to take risks. You're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to make a commitment. You're going to have to work for it. Um, and and uh, that's kind of hard for some of us. I'll just confess. I'm lazy. You know, I just want stuff to be easy. And it's not. You know, it's kind of like uh, I want the weight to just fall off without diet and exercise. You guys with me on that? So, you know, but it's not going to happen. It, you know, I can wish for it all I want. It's just not going to happen. And you can be sitting here going, yeah, I want to be free spiritually. But if you're not willing to invest yourself, if you're not willing to, to, to say, hey, I'm going to go to a life group. I'm going to study the stuff. I'm going to do the homework. I'm going to show up for worship. I'm gonna, I want freedom. Then, uh, you, you're, you know, 
you're not going to get it. So I hope and pray that you choose to walk the path of freedom with us. And, and honestly, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Are, are you waiting for you know, someone to rescue you, a hero to ride in and save the day? It's already happened. His name is Jesus. And he gave himself on the cross for your sins so that you could be free. In fact, he said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And so freedom is there. It's offered to you. It's available to you. So today, are you ready to start the journey home? Uh, Luke chapter 15 is our text, beginning at verse 11. And it's a story that is familiar to many of you. Uh, it's the story of the prodigal son. And so if, uh, like me, you grew up in church, you've heard this story taught, preached, uh, re referenced. Even if you didn't grow up in church or read the Bible, uh, it, it's a story that's worked its way into our, you know, uh, culture so that we kind of reference prodigals uh, without knowing the origin. So this is the story, and, and there's always a risk when we're familiar that we don't really pay attention to what it tells us. So I'm just going to uh, ask you, if you've never heard it before, listen intently. But if you've heard it before, listen intently. Because this is a story about us and about God. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And the father divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is a story about us and about God. It's both heartbreaking and hopeful. First of all, this is a story about our rebellion. It's about our rebellion. The son, the younger son, asked for his inheritance early. Doesn't get much more disrespectful than that. And yet, if you're like me, you read this and there's no real emotional uh, connection to the story because we don't really do it. Oh, okay, he asked for his inheritance early. Basically, that's the son saying to his dad, you're not dying fast enough. I wish you were dead. Can I have my money now? Now, that's pretty rude. Now, I, I look around this room, there's a lot of men in here and a lot of you have kids. Can you imagine, what would your reaction be if, you, if one of your kids came to you and said that? Dad, you're not dying fast enough. Can I have my money now? 
yeah, are you going to give it to him? I don't think so. You're going to go to the lawyer and write him out of the will. Or maybe, you know, leave him in the will and give him a penny so they have to show up and get it. You know, because you want to rub their noses in it because you're going to say, hey, you are a petulant little brat. But the father does the scandalous thing and he gives him his inheritance. And of course, the son wasted it, living in a way that dishonored his dad. So think. God has blessed us incredibly. He's blessed us with life. I mean, you're here, you're alive. He's blessed us with health. We're healthy enough to be here. May not be the health you want, but you've got enough health. He's blessed us with relationships. Every person in your life that loves you and blesses you and you're glad they're a part of your life is from God. And he's blessed us with stuff. It may not be all the stuff that you wish you had, but it's more stuff than most people have. And what have we done with it? We have used God's blessings to live in ways that have dishonored God. Now, it may not be uh, your entire life has been that way, but all of us have spent some time, a season or so, in the faraway land in reckless living, dishonoring our Father's inheritance. And I know that because Scripture tells us that. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and you know, they taught me in school that all means all. All of us have sinned. Romans 3.10 gets a little more specific. There is no one righteous, not even one. So if you're thinking that you're different than everybody else, you're not. You see, when I look in the mirror, what I see is a scum-sucking pig sinner. Okay, because Scripture tells me that it is, and I know that I've taken God's gifts, God's blessings, God's uh, you know, inheritance for me, and I've wasted it in ways that dishonored God. So I don't know how long your season in that faraway land was. Maybe it was days, maybe it was weeks, maybe it was months, maybe it was years, maybe it was decades. I just know that we've all been there. We've all rebelled. And because of that rebellion, at some point we ended up where we didn't want to be. So let's talk about our reality. The prodigal ended up in the pig pen feeding swine. Now, can I just say this? That's not really scandalous for us in America, you know, with our roots, our history as an agrarian culture. People growing up on farms and saying, hey, it's honorable to feed pigs. You know, I, we raise pigs or whatever. We knew people who raised pigs. Uh, okay, that's great. But here's the thing. 100% of Jewish audience Jesus' audience was Jewish. They, they were Jewish. They, you guys understand kosher means no pigs, right? It means they don't eat them. They don't want to be around them. They're, they're, you know, they're unclean. And so the very worst profession possible for a Jewish boy would be a pig farmer. And he's working for a pig farmer, and he's so desperate, he's so hungry, so broken, that he wants to eat the pig slop. This is bottom of the barrel. This is the end of the rope. It doesn't get any lower than this for our prodigal. And the truth is, our rebellion takes all of us to a broken reality. Every one of us. You know, maybe it was divorce. Maybe it's bankruptcy. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's a toxic person. Maybe it's a business failure. Maybe it's your kids walking away from God. Maybe it's you losing all purpose and meaning in life and just wanting to die. We've all found ourselves in a place we never dreamed of being. And if you haven't, <laughs> it might be that you're on your way. And for many of us, that broken reality, that place of pain and failure, led us to make a change. And the next chapter in the story is about our repentance. Our repentance. The prodigal came to himself. He came to his senses. He suddenly realized how stupid he had been and, and how his father's servants were treated better than he is as a free man. And, and, and so he repents. I'm not worthy to be your son. Can I be one of your servants? By the way, if you're ever wondering what repentance looks like, 
The prodigal son story is a great example uh, of what repentance actually looks like. First of all, he admits he was wrong. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. It's my fault. I was wrong. I screwed up. I made the mistake. It's on me. He takes responsibility. That's what admitting you're wrong does. That's what confession does. I'm responsible. So he admits he was wrong, and, and then he lets go of his rights. Uh, I don't know if you realize this or not, but a lot of us live with a sense of entitlement. And uh, the, the prodigal was entitled when he came to his dad and said, you're not dying fast enough, I want my inheritance. You owe this to me. But now when he's going home, he says, you don't owe me anything, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And a lot of us, well, we have those expectations of others or of God. And he let go of his rights. He let go of his, his expectations. He let go of his entitlement. And he humbles himself and he says, I'm not worthy. And he asks for mercy. Can I be one of your servants? Can I just work for you? Because I know what an honorable man you are and how you treat your servants. And then he decides to go home. He decides to go home. So have you come to a place of repentance in your life? Have you had that come to your senses moment where suddenly you realize what a fool you've been and that you need to go home, you need God? Because it's in repentance where freedom is born. It's in that moment of brokenness where we come to our senses where our real journey to freedom begins because now we realize, i got to go home. I, I've been wrong, I've messed up, but, but I, I can go home and be a servant. And that repentance is where freedom is, is birthed in our lives. When we admit to God that we are wrong, that we've rebelled, that we've brought this destruction on ourselves. When we let go of our rights and our demands and our expectations, that, that sense of, God, you owe me. God, if you loved me, you'd do this for me or that for me or heal me or, or make this work. And we let go of all that and we, and we humble ourselves. And we say, God, I'm not worthy of heaven. I'm not worthy of eternal life. I, I actually deserve hell. I deserve eternal damnation. And, and, we, and we ask for mercy. Please forgive me. Jesus, save me. Help me. Change my life. I don't want to be in this place anymore. I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to start over. And that's when we turn toward home. And sometimes we come to our senses and we still hang out in the pig pen. Because we're afraid to go home. And, you know, that's one of the things Jesus didn't tell us in the story is how long did the prodigal stay in the pig pen? Practicing his speech and yet not having the courage to go home. Because maybe, maybe you're afraid that you screwed up too much. Maybe you're afraid that God's angry and going to reject you. Maybe you believe that you deserve to live in the pig pen the rest of your life. Maybe you think if you show up at church, the roof will collapse. Look up. The steel beams aren't going anyplace. That's why Jesus shares the father's reaction in the story. So let's look at the reception. Now, this is not what we expect. This is not what the audience expects. Again, we're familiar with the story, so we know how it plays out. We know how it ends. But, but honestly, this is not the uh, reception the son was expecting. I know for me, when I went home repentant as a kid, that is not the reception I got. Okay? I don't know about you, but I had a stern disciplinarian for a dad. And so if I came home and confessed and I'd messed up, you, you know what I got? I got a lecture. I got reprimanded. I got privilege loss. You know, I got grounded. Uh, sometimes I got whooped. That's what I expected. But the father's reaction in this story is unexpected and undignified because this is a story about God and how incredible his grace really is for us. See, first of all, the father runs toward his son. He sees him a far way off and he runs out and embraces him. And, and by the way, just for the record, Jewish fathers didn't run. It was undignified. 
Then we're going to run, especially not to a rebellious son. Let him come begging on his knees, pleading for mercy. And maybe you'll let him be a servant. Maybe. But not our God. Not our God. When, when we repent, when we move toward God, God meets us there with eagerness, with joy, with expectation. In, in other words, God wants you to come home. He wants you to live in his blessings. He wants you to experience his healing. He wants you to be with family. You see, God isn't embarrassed by you. He's not angry at you. God doesn't want to punish you. I hope you realize that life has already done that because we reap what we sow, and if we sow to the flesh, from the flesh we reap destruction. God wants to love you, and he's never stopped loving you. But here's the thing, when we're living in that faraway land, when we're in the pig pen, we don't experience his love. He wants us to experience his love and live in the joy of that. So the Father runs toward us, and the Father forgives us. When we repent, there is always grace. I love the promise of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. If we confess, there is always mercy, there is always grace. God forgives us, God restores us. In other words, there is a robe for our shoulders, there is a ring for our finger, there are shoes for our feet, and all of those are signs of sonship. In other words, we might think, hey, can I just be your servant? And God says, no, you're a son. You're a daughter. You're mine. And it's way more than we ever deserve, but that's why we call it mercy. That's why it's grace. And, and this is the incredible good news of the gospel. It's scandalous the way that God treats us. Because no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how you've rebelled, no matter what pig pen you've lived in, forgiveness is yours when you come home. And people say, no, it's, that sounds too good to be true. I've got to do something to earn it. I've got to, I've got to beg more. I've got to plead more. I've got to be gloom and doom. No. Again, this is the scandal of the gospel. It's a gift that God offers to you the moment that you come home. That's why we wonder, what are you waiting for? This grace is waiting for us. And then the crazy thing happens. The Father celebrates. Father celebrates. He throws a party. Why? Because my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. This is a picture of God's heart. God celebrates whenever the lost are found. And, and, if, and if you don't believe me, then read the entire chapter of Luke 15. It's three stories. The last one's the prodigal son. But the first two are the, are the same message. And that is that God wants the lost to be found. And when the lost are found, all of heaven throws a party. Heaven was celebrating today. At, at, at the moment of baptism, when, when, you know, she's declaring, I love Jesus and I want the world to know it. When we come home, heaven celebrates. And, and God throws a party. Which is why we are relentlessly focused on our mission here at Calvary. Because we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's why we celebrate life change here at Calvary. And, and, and that's why we're undignified at baptisms. Thank you for joining in that. And that's why we rejoice in people's stories of grace. Because God is throwing a party and we want to join it. And in that moment, we also have to realize that not everyone likes that. Not everyone likes the party. You see, Jesus could have ended the story right there. And they began to celebrate. But he didn't end the story right there. There's a, a third of the story is about the older son. Now, he's aiming that at the Pharisees of his day who, you know, thought they knew God but didn't celebrate grace. But there are some people who don't want to celebrate grace. They don't really want to go to the party, and that's the older son. I mean, you know, he, he just wasn't happy about his brother coming home and dad forgiving him. He didn't like grace for his brother. Um, 
And maybe you're like that. Maybe you don't appreciate grace for others. Maybe you just appreciate grace for you. Because most of us really like grace for us, don't we? I mean, we like the fact that we're forgiven, that, that our sins are atoned for. We really like the fact that God loves us, even though we're sinners, even though we're scum-sucking pig sinners, even though we're, we're rebellious. We, we really enjoy grace for us, but, you know, uh, my sins are one thing, because they're not all that bad, but your sins are messed up. Right? And isn't that what we end up doing? I mean, churches all across this country, this is one of the reasons that they're not reaching people is because they think their sins are okay and that God loves them, but you're not so much. And, and they want grace for them, but they don't want it to spill out to just anybody. And the older brother was fine with his younger brother coming home, but he wanted him to live as a servant. And he probably wanted him to have the job of, like, cleaning out the cattle stalls or something. Spend the rest of his life scooping poop. And, uh, and eating bread and drinking water and not really living as a son. And so he wasn't really thrilled about grace for his brother. And... and if that's you, if you kind of were raised and you believe in a culture of guilt and shame, uh, that, that's, that's not God. Or maybe you're like me and you've got that voice in your head because I was raised in that culture, that voice of accusation so that, that if I'm not doing the, the right you know, religious stuff all the time, that that voice accuses me, tells me I'm a failure, tells me I shouldn't rejoice, tells me I need to you know, do more penance or whatever. Uh, that voice is not God. You see, grace abounds. That's what the story is about. And, and, and if you're stuck in that whole guilt and shame thing, if you're stuck on not wanting to uh, you know, give grace to other people, then I just want you to know the joy of forgiveness. We want you to experience the joy of forgiveness. We want you to know the power of God to change lives. And we want you to join God's party. By the way, God's entreating you to come in and to join the celebration. He wants you there. He wants all of us to celebrate grace and mercy and forgiveness. So let me ask you this question, and I hope you wrestle with this beyond this morning. Where are you in this story? This is a story of us and of God. Where are you in the story? Are you in rebellion? You know, are, are, like the prodigal, are you in the pig pen someplace? Or maybe you're like the angry older brother just refusing to come into the party because the world isn't like you think it is and people aren't living the way you think they should live. Maybe you're in the painful reality of failure right now. Maybe this morning you're coming to your senses. Or, or maybe you've already come to your senses and decided to repent and that's why you're here. Maybe you've experienced the grace of God and you've been restored. Maybe you're just celebrating uh, and you're at the party wondering why more people aren't coming. It's our story. Where are you in it? And are you ready to come home? Because today God invites you to come home. And we invite you to participate in a not-so-perfect path to freedom. So honestly, what are you waiting for? Because heaven is waiting for you so they can celebrate. In other words, is there a party with your name on it? Then come home. Let's pray.